So, facilitating change in relation to climate change and all about climate smart agriculture. I'm going to cover four things. The global challenges, the rise of the sea climate smart agriculture. Can we be optimistic to ac actually meet these global challenges? And the last piece, I was asked to talk a little bit about Ireland taking a leadership role in the CSA movement. So the global challenges, and you know all this stuff. The first challenge, and I think agriculture and food systems stand at the nexus of three of the greatest challenges in the 21st century. And the first one is the whole food supply issue, food security challenges throughout sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and some parts of uh, Latin America. But it's not only about undersupply, it's also about overconsumption. So 1.5 billion adults overweight, more than they're undernutrition in the world. And Ireland is in the top league in this regard. Food waste, another issue with related to supply. So we have a, a, almost a billion people going hungry, and yet we waste a third of the food we produce. So the first challenge is all around food supply. The second challenge is the adaptation challenge. So this is a series of spots around the world where they've been able to do detailed modeling on wheat production and looking at the change in yield. And so the, the dark blue is where yield is going to go down by significant amounts. So the wheat r shows that there's a 6% yield loss for each degree of uh, uh, temperature rise equivalent to a quarter of the global trade in wheat. This is a major in terms of the future. Just let's look at one crop in, in different parts of the world. This is coffee crop. And if you go to s South America, down in the corner, the brown is where there's a negative change for the coffee production from that part of the world. And as you can see, there's brown everywhere in terms of coffee. So this means livelihoods, producer associations are going to have to think about different crops completely over the next decades. Is it something that we can only model into the future? I don't think so. This is the IPCC where there's now evidence that you can, you can pick out the climate impacts on, for example, these two crops, maize and wheat. So a 4% decline, there has been a 4% decline in maize yield over the last uh, two decades, I think, or 15 years, when you factor out the other impacts on yield. So they, you're already picking up impacts of climate change. So that was the second challenge, the adaptation challenge. The third one is the emission challenge, which you, you mentioned at the start. So can everybody from the agricultural sector argues that agriculture is the most important thing for food security and therefore we should be not given the targets? So we believe that you c agriculture cannot be excused from the emission targets. This is the total emission, uh, emissions at the moment, 48 gigatons. The blue is from the non-agricultural emissions. The yellow is from agriculture and land cover change forestry sector. And this is 2010. If it's business as usual, as we're doing now, this is what the picture will be in 2050. If we want to keep the world at a two degree warmer, this is what we have to achieve. 21 gigatons. If you excuse agriculture from emissions and every other sector has to do it, agriculture will contribute 70% of emissions by 2050. For me, it's impossible. Why are other sectors going to allow agriculture to be let off the hook? So for us, we believe that emission reductions are crucial in the agricultural sector. Often, if you listen to some of the NGOs that we work with in the South, they often talk about industrial agriculture as being the problem. Well. We, we put it quite clearly that that's not the case, that there are emission challenges in the south as well. So this is, the size of the circle is related to the emissions from different parts of the world. And one of the big ones is this olive green, I think it is, indirect 
emissions from agriculture. This is agriculture as a driver of deforestation. So with major emissions from that in Southeast Asia and Central America. And the rest, the other colors are the different P subsectors of agriculture. And there's particular challenges in different parts of the world. So rice, methane production in Southeast Asia, uh, burning in, in Africa, uh, different pieces in different places. So the second part of the talk is now, how do we achieve, how do we rise to those three challenges? And this is the rise of the CSA movement. And it's, it's addressing the three challenges. The productivity, food security challenge, the adaptation challenge, and the mitigation challenge. And in September last year, the uh, UN Secretary General launched the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture, GAXA, consisting of different kinds of players. So diff about 100 different uh, units have signed up to this, be they governments, farmers' organizations, scientific uh, groups, etc. And they organized around three different uh, initiatives, an action group, uh, a knowledge group, an uh, investment group, so this is bringing investment into the agricultural and food system area, and the policy enabling environment group. We, together with FAO, lead the knowledge group. The investment group is led by uh, the Tanzanian Ministry and uh, DFID in the UK. Enabling environment is led by USDA and one other country group I forget at the moment. And, around, and the outcomes are aimed for our productivity, resilience, emissions uh, outcomes. As an example, this was the one that was announced in September. This is the kind of target that has to be achieved in the next few decades or next 15 years. 500 million people, uh, farmers, uh, their resilience improved. In, in this is in relation to the adaptation challenge. So this is a huge target in terms of the kinds of things that have to happen. What about mitigation? So we have a group of 30 of the top scientists at the moment working on a mitigation target, and this is not published yet, they believe that the agricultural sector has to de decrease emissions by one gigaton carbon dioxide per year to help war limit the warming to two degrees. And they believe that that's feasible with, uh, with a food security goal as well. So not compromising food security. But that number is not published yet. It's, it's, so I, I shouldn't, you shouldn't take it away too much. It has to, uh, uh, next few months. So what is Climate Smart Agriculture? And I want to take an example of uh, alternate wetting and drying in rice. It's an amazing technology. You flood the rice for, f for the first 15 days, and then you only irrigate it when it needs the water. So you dry it out, essentially. And you can reduce the water by 30%. You can reduce greenhouse gases by up to 50% without compromising the yield. So it's getting at these different uh, climate smart agriculture outcomes. This is some actual data from a particular area in a particular season. The blue is the conventional agriculture, and the green is the AWD, alternate wetting and drying. And you can get a 42% decline in greenhouse gases. So it looks good. But the point that we also like making is that you shouldn't label anything climate smart agriculture, because the context is so important. And here's the example. Do the same thing in different places, and you get different results. And so therefore, even a fantastic technology like AWD cannot be labeled as climate smart agriculture because it doesn't work in some places. This makes life very difficult, of course. We would love to say, this is climate smart agriculture, this is not climate smart agriculture, but in fact, the context, and it's not only the biophysical context, it's farmers' context, their labor resources, their assets, also determines what is possible and what is not possible. So many practices can be CSA somewhere, but none are likely to be CSA everywhere. This makes it very difficult for development agencies, for farmers' organizations to promote something because it really has to be promoted on a case-by-case -case basis. So the third section is, can we be optimistic about rising to those challenges? And by the way, beans 
are the first things that are likely to disappear from Africa in terms of the temperature, a limitation on, on growing beans. So some people really believe that the world is going to be in a different place in a couple of decades. And these are kings from Uganda, presidents of South Africa, president of IFAD, International Fund for Agricultural Development, essentially saying Africa can be the next breadbasket of the world. Is that, I mean, I, I think this optimistic vision is great. Is it really feasible? So this is on the food security side. Now let's look at the adaptation challenge. If the world goes to a four degree warmer world, this is Africa using 14 climate models. The dark gray is a greater than 20% loss in um, growing season. So my country, Zimbabwe, is pure gray. In other words, the agricultural sector that we know today is wiped out. This is 2090, it's a long way in the distance, but nonetheless, the extreme events that are going to be happen as part of this shift to a different climate are going to be there much uh, earlier than 2090. So the adaptation challenge in Africa is particularly pronounced. <coughs> what about the mitigation? And let's look at Africa again. Central Africa, I predict it's the next frontier of deforestation. So we've seen Indonesia go, we've seen Brazil go to a significant amount the prediction would be is that Central America is next on the cards with major greenhouse gas emission. The place where people are actually looking for this breadbasket are the wet savannas where people say they are, there's lots of uh, unused land. We can move in with uh, high-tech soya bean, high-tech uh, maize production. It's 140 million hectares except it's really carbon rich. So it could be 30 million tons of carbon dioxide emitted from this kind of area. In addition to other issues of land grabs and social, uh, 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 disrupting social systems. <coughs> so the African situation, while some people see a vision for bread baskets, has to be put against, well, what are the adaptation challenges? And can we do it in a climate friendly way or not? So now I'm going to get positive. I hope, yeah. So l let's take an optimistic view. I mean, if you keep on Africa, in the early 2000s, it was all about the hopeless continent, Africa's woes. And in the recent years, there's, some, there's a very different narrative about Africa, about Africa rising. Let's look at some of the trends. So this is the predicted food demand in Africa going from 2015 forward. All these graphs are put on the same uh, axis, so you can see all you need to look at is the, the angle of the graph. This is grain yield per hectare. Now, that's not very promising because it's at a lower slope than um, the food demand. GDP is really going, and, and this is a very promising aspect of, of Africa's development. But look at the next one. This is cell phone penetration into rural areas or in Africa. Major changes. So our prediction would be that in a decade, every farmer in Africa has access to a cell phone, a smartphone. And so I now want to just give five examples of, um, of positive aspects so that one can see that there is a vision for optimism. So this is uh, climate information services using working with farmers for two seasons, looking at indigenous methods of uh, predicting the, the season that's coming, looking at scientific ways, working with male and female farmers, different kinds of farmers, how do you like to get climate information, uh, and doing quite complicated things with farmers group, probabilistic seasonal forecasts done in the context of multiple partners, so this is a local working group for early warning system, different subsectors of the agricultural sector, the MET department, seed growers, etc., etc., and getting, how do you get the messages to people through different formats at the bottom. And then in the third season, working with the Union of Rural Radio to actually put the forecasts in place. And this, this last year, 
they reach just over 3 million farmers with seasonal forecasts, allowing farmers to have some information, if they trust it, of course, about what they can do in the coming season. So this is a kind of positive uh, developments that are happening in Africa. Kenya, getting the message out. So there's, there's this amazing TV program in Kenya. It's a reality TV. You, you know the ones about make over your house and make over your body and all those sorts of things. This is make over your farm. And it's the, one of the most popular TV programs. They're reaching 13 million people in East Africa, 60% in rural areas. And each week they make over a different person's farm. And what we do as a scientific organization is we provide some of the science for the kinds of things they're dealing with. The uh, University of Reading has just done a study to look at what the impact of that TV program is. So four, nearly 450,000 farmers have made changes in their maize or dairy practices. This, they're just looking at these two sec subsectors. Or a 24 million net economic impact in 25 counties in Kenya. So this is a Another example of the vision for change in Africa with new technologies reaching into rural areas. Nigeria. It can be very difficult working in Nigeria, but there's been a visionary Ministry of Agriculture. And it just shows uh, the Minister of Agriculture. just shows what can happen with visionary ministers. In, they, 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 they set up a mobile platform, this is on cell phones, for the delivery of fer fertilizer subsidies. In, one of the, in the very first few seasons, they reached 4.3 million smallholders who were being served by this cell phone platform. The subsidy cost was reduced by 80%. They've now reached, they've now reached the 10 million farmers. Just two weeks ago, we were working with Swiss Ray to design an index-based insurance. So the next, uh, the next uh, part is to bring insurance to the farmers where they buy insurance on their phone as they buy their inputs. And when the, the rainfall goes below a certain amount, they get paid out immediately, and they get paid back into their cell phones. So with new technologies, you can get away from the, pr the problem of, for example, of that extension services are, are so difficult. And the next vision for the same ministry in, in Nigeria is advisories arriving by cell phone to farmers. <coughs> the fourth example, and now we go from two different continents. So this is the gene bank in Peru for sweet potatoes and potatoes. And essentially, these are treasure troves for the next decades. They're now screening the sweet potato for heat tolerance, doing trials in, in Peru. And this is some of the res early results. So on the right-hand side is when you don't stress the plant, the amount of yield. Uh, the left-hand side is when you heat stress the plant. So you can get four times lower um, uh, yields when it's heat stressed, as in the future. But the tails of the graph with all those little dots indicates how variable the yield is depending on which particular variety they're dealing with. So the next step is to use some of those varieties that show heat tolerance and to, to breed them up in terms of uh, seed systems. So since 2012, the, potato, the Center for International, International Potato Center and its partners have delivered the orange fle fre fleshed sweet potato to 1.2 million households in East and Southern Africa. And this is a vitamin, vitamin A rich uh, sweet potato. Their target is 15 million by 2023. Now, what they have to overlay on that the vitamin rich one is heat tolerance for the next decades. And these kinds of programs take a long time. What we do as a program, we have things called Climate Smart Villages throughout the globe, where essentially you work with farmers, local service providers, farmers' organizations, on what technologies do they want. Uh, they could be technologies, it could be climate information services in terms of forecasts, village development plans, so adaptation plans. Uh, working on, uh, based on local knowledge and institutions as well. And in these kinds of places, we may take the technology of the potato center or the livestock center, and we offer them to farmers, mix them with the indigenous thing, and, and get upscaling. 
This is now taken off in India where some of the state governments are now incentivizing, for example, a thousand uh, villages in Haryana state. <coughs> the last uh, uh, example I wanted to give was of the major initiatives that are happening. And one of them is the Alliance for Climate Smart Ag Agriculture in Africa, which has got a, tar a, a specific target. And it's made up of six of the major NGOs, FAO, ourselves, uh, and, and some of the big African uh, uh, development agencies. So, for example, CADAP, the Comprehensive Africa A Agricultural Development Program. So I think this is part of the, the success of the CSA movement, is getting people together to tackle these problems. An another, another thing that's happened in the last few months is the Green Climate Fund has, has had a paper before it of the potential investment areas. And one of them is climate smart agriculture. I think it's a major coup for agriculture in terms of having agriculture on the agenda for the Green Climate Fund. They've got 10 billion in the bank at the moment, and these are five investment areas. The intention is to go to $100 billion of investment. So, can I, Ireland play a leadership role? Uh, so, I was asked to talk about this, and then I should preface by saying that I am the least qualified to speak about Ireland, or any developed country in the world, because my, all my experience is in developing countries. But we do commission global analyses so that we understand where the developing country is sitting within the uh, global situation. So, the first thing I would say is that Ireland has to be really bold and transformative. And so the next statement I'm likely to do is, is going to irritate some people in the audience. So you have your origin green Ireland. And I would say that we'd only take you seriously if you also put on the table tackling food waste, tackling overconsumption, rebalancing the livestock component of future diets. These are issues which global players believe have to be part of the solution. And so if you want to be a leader in this, in this area, going green or origin green has to tackle these difficult issues. You have to have debates about them, have to think about them in terms of where they sit in the, the solution space. I've been extremely impressed with the US in terms of climate smart agriculture, where they take a whole of government approach. Senator Kerry was solving ISIS problems in the morning and launching the climate smart agriculture in the afternoon. The State Department, the USDA, the USAID are totally interlinked in terms of how they're dealing with climate smart agriculture and working with farmers' organizations and civil society. So I think that's a crucial piece of getting multiple stakeholders onto the issue. Ireland has to be at a cutting edge of greenhouse gas emissions per unit output. And, and I think, you know, although you can, you can state about your greenhouse gases and how important it is for agriculture, you should know that you're not alone in this mitigation challenge. Agriculture contributes 50% mo or more of greenhouse gas emissions in 43 countries. So that's more greenhouse gas, em greenhouse gas emissions than in, uh, in Ireland. Most countries, we would say they're, they're doing modest aims based on what is possible, rather than really what is needed. You would have to be the leader in research and development on greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, or perhaps from the livestock sector. Advanced labs, working with developing countries that have a, a big livestock sector. I think you also have to be at the advanced edge of incentive schemes for farmers, experimenting with carbon markets, so Australia, for example, has a really innovative scheme uh, related to, I think it's called the Carbon Farming Initiative. And it's a related to incentives for farmers to do agriculture in a different way. And I think you need to be leading coalitions of, of like-minded players. So for example, the obvious one for you is New Zealand, which faces the same kind of challenges. I would say Australia, which has shown innovation, but I think you also need to pick developing countries as well. And so, for example, one for me would be Vietnam, 
They've set a, 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 an emission target for their country. Uh, it's mostly related to the rice sector. But it's a country that's wanting to move forward and do things differently. In Africa, Kenya wants to be the first African country to put a climate policy in place. They're, not, they, 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 they're willing to talk about mitigation as well. So it would be another country which could be part of a coalition. What about in developing countries? <coughs> I mean, the, the, one, the one issue is Ireland is a, is a relatively small country in the global scene. CSA covers numerous aspects. So what is the focus area for your developing country initiatives? I think you need to pick a focus area or to pick certain countries where it's a whole of government type approach from farmer level, farmer organizations, national policy making. I think one of the crucial things for moving forward is connectedness. And I gave these examples of radio, TV, mobile technology. To me, that's the whole area of where change is going to be possible. So you can do as much R&D as you like, but if you don't have a good R&D system linked to the farmers, it's pretty pathetic. So this whole issue of how do you get farmers connected to each other and to the, the research and development space. And this includes strengthening farmer organizations, which in, in many countries are not very strong. The last piece would be results-based. So we, we are really strong believers in results-based management. Pick countries where things are going to happen and it's going to work. Uh, be willing to move out when they're not working. Uh, we, we've, we're a program that runs across 15 centers, and we do results-based management, and those examples that I showed you about delivering to 3 million farmers in Senegal on climate wouldn't have been possible, I don't think, a few years ago. But now we've put targets and in, uh, uh, indicators in place, and if, if organizations fail to meet them, we tend to want to reduce budgets and, and budgets to other places. So I think you should be very results-based. But not forgetting some things, like what drives equitable outcomes. So for example, often the results base may come down to technologies. We must also think about gender dimensions, the whole institutional arrangements. So one has to work with that stuff. And one also has to think about the longer term. So for example, developing these heat resistant varieties or varieties that are gonna uh, uh, deal with Rising sea levels and saline soils takes time. So one also needs to work on those kinds of things. Thanks.